and always will, is about moving humanity forward. And remember, folks, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Hey, folks, the man with the pinky ring and the New York thing. Forget about it. Bad Brad Berkwood. And you're watching another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. Now, make sure that you hit that button in whatever corner it's in and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. Leave your comments below the video. I always personally respond. And as well, follow me on Twitter at BadBradRSR. Again, it's at BadBradRSR. Well, today is Saturday, and it's this evening here in Northwest Indiana, but don't tell nobody. And I have a special guest. She is the host of the Caffeinated Cooper podcast show as well she's an actress producer and writer she is a lady that's had me on her show twice and i greatly appreciate that so it was long overdue for her to come on mine so folks without further ado please welcome to my show the one and only elizabeth cooper forget about it well first of all elizabeth good evening to you how are you? Thank you so much. I'm excited to be on your show. I'm doing well. Good, good, good. We're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to do a 360 of you, all about you, no specific topics. Um, I want people to get a view of you. Uh, as well, I always start out like this. If I have anything wrong in my notes, because we know, as I always use air quotes, the internet is not always correct. Say, hey, Brad, it's actually this. I will not be offended. All right, sounds good. Okay, so let's start out like this. Let's let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like you were born in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and grew up in Metuchen. Is that am I saying right? That's right, Metuchen, okay. New Jersey. I practiced yeah. that, folks, before we went on. New Jersey. <laughs> now I want to read a little note for the viewers. Metuchen is a suburban borough in Middlesex County, in the, obviously the U.S. state of New Jersey. The borough is a commuter town of New York City, love New York City, located in the heart of, is it Raritan Valley? Is that how you say it? It is, it's Raritan Valley. Um, it's in the middle of Edison. So okay. if most everybody's familiar with Thomas Edison, uh -huh. and that town you know, is named after him. And uh, so we are the donut hole because Edison goes all the way around us and we're the donut hole, Metuchen, New Jersey. Okay, what I would like you to do for the viewers, talk about growing up there. Oh my God. It was a great childhood growing up there. It was still that quiet, small town. Everybody knew everybody else. It has definitely taken um, a, a different turn over the years. You know, there's a lot of rebuild. So when I was growing up, there were Victorian homes all the way up to maybe some of those like 70s style bungalow type homes. And that was our town of Metuchen. And we had a main street so all of us kids could go down to main street and we would go you know to the deli or you know the drugstore the five and dime you know wherever um it was a really cool town to grow up in my um there's many celebrities that came out of that town as well so desi arnaz and lucille ball lived there and they actually lived not at the same time but when my parents were married they settled in Metuchen and they lived in the same apartment complex that Lucille and Desi did. But at that oh, time, cool. they had moved. Um, so they were not there at that time. My sister went to high school with um, David Copperfield. And, you know, so there's, it was a very creative environment for that. Um, there were many actors and actresses because in our town, we had the Amtrak. So it was a real easy, quick ride into the city. So lots of models, a lot of actors, um, and then, you know, everyday folk too. So it was, it was a cool town. Okay. I want to read something and then we'll talk about it on the other side. I always love doing research on people. And sometimes I find what I feel is a little chestnut. And I want to read this to you and see if you were even aware of this or if you even heard this. Now, when I was reading your bio, your dad's name is Martin Sloan. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's spelled last name is S-L-O-A-N, right? No E. Right? right. Okay, I want to ask you this. Well, the minute I saw his name, and you may know where I'm going with this, but I'm going to do it for the viewers too. I had to double check the spelling. And again, it's S-L-O-A-N. 
did you know that my show, you may not know this part, but my favorite show of all time is The Twilight Zone, the iconic show by Rod Serling. Well, in season one, episode five, there was a uh, episode called Walking Distance. And Gig Young was the star of it, young Ronnie Howard. He was billed as Ronnie Howard. He was probably about four or five. And the character that he played, and that one was loosely based on Rod Serling, where he grew up in upstate New York. And it's my favorite, favorite episode of all time. The character's name was Martin Sloan. Oh, really? Did I you know didn't that? know that. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, and I did grow up watching The Twilight Zone. Um, and The Blob was like one of those movies that my brother and I would sit there and watch. <laughs> yeah, it was Steve McQueen. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to send you a link to that episode. And like I said, it it's a very, very uh, touching episode. Great music, everything. It's my, my favorite. That's my favorite series, but that was my favorite one. But as soon as I saw that name, I said, let me double check. I couldn't remember if it was with an E, or, but sure enough, Martin Sloan. Okay. You, um, we're going to talk about some of the things that you've done in your life. First thing I wanted to talk about is, I believe you worked for the Weather Channel. Is that correct? I did. Yes. Talk about that. So I, let's see, I kind of have to backtrack a little bit. Um, I worked for Aon. They had a division called Combined Insurance. Okay. And um, I worked there for a while. And that's how I transferred from North Carolina to um, Atlanta area. And I was in North Carolina because some people may remember in like 1990, 1991, uh, Smith Klein and Beecham merged. And Beecham was located in Piscataway, New Jersey. So my father had the option of moving his entire family to Philadelphia and stay with Smith Klein Beecham or take an early retirement at the age of 52. So we took the early retirement and moved from where we were in New Jersey to Western North Carolina. And I was finishing high school at that time, so I moved with them. It was, I mean, the biggest culture shock I can imagine ever having and still being in the United States. <laughs> uh, you know, everybody still spoke English, but it, it, the accents just totally threw me off. I couldn't understand anybody for the first six, seven months that I lived there. And then two years later, somebody uh, was talking, you know, just high school friends. And they said, oh, did you hear so-and-so got into a wreck? And I said, well, that's terrible. But what do you mean? <laughs> and they said, well, they got into a wreck. And I'm like, I I'm sorry, like no compute. I have no idea what you're saying. Right. A, a car hit another car. And I'm like, Oh, a car accident. Gotcha. So, you know, there are just so many things region by region that culturally is very different. And it's spoken in the language. And man, you just don't know where you are. So anyway, um, I transferred from North Carolina with Aon to um, Atlanta. And the Atlanta division was not as strong as what they had in North Carolina. So I started interviewing and I landed a job at the Weather Channel and I was in marketing. Um, it was a great job and I was able to you know, get many uh, promotions. And I mean, I just loved it there. It was a wonderful community to work within and um, you know, met a lot of the on-camera meteorologists and it was a lot of fun. And then I, I got married and we decided that I needed to be a stay-at-home mom. And that was one of the hardest transitions I've ever done in my life. Okay. Weather, weather people, which I respect them, but that's one job where you can get it wrong. You still keep your job, right? <laughs> that's only, that's the only the, the, the corny joke that they throw on weather people, but it's, but it is true. Okay. You've acted, you've produced, you've written. Out of those three things, if you had to put one at the top, what do you enjoy the most? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I would say probably acting because in the acting world, the job of it is auditioning. Your your job is is just all that, you know. So when you book a role and you actually get to do what they call acting, that's that's like dessert after your meaty meal, you know. That's that's just um, it, it's so rewarding, and you are such a, a, 
you know, it's like what they say about roles and characters. You're either born for that or you're not. And that can help a lot of actors digest those no's. Because like I said, most of what you're doing is auditioning and you're getting a lot of no, 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 no before you ever hear a yes. So by the time you hear a yes, it's like being in front of that camera and on set and working with your cast family and the crew members. It's such a magical experience that I really do enjoy that. Um, but I enjoy all of them. That's, that's a tough question. Okay. All right. Looking at your bio, it looks like in about 2015, you moved out to LA to try to pursue acting. And reading it, you made me think of my father because he, he went out there in the 60s. He had some success off Broadway in New York. And he said, well, you know what everybody says, you gotta go to Hollywood. And TV and everything was moving out of New York to Hollywood. I mean, years before we were born. But um, I, it said in there that uh, you had some success, but when you went out there, it was tough because without solid connections, and I, that's the first thing I thought about my dad. They, he would go here, he would try to talk to this one. And if you didn't have those, those concrete connections before you went out there, and sometimes even those didn't pan out because I almost almost went out there too and tried it, but I didn't feel the connections were strong. I'm like, ah, I'll stay, I'll stay on the East Coast. But talk about your, your time out there. And the other thing too, looking at 2015, because that was, uh, I, I did act in 2013, 2014. And I, you talked about auditions, which I want to piggyback off that for a second and have you talk about L.A., I kind of was getting annoyed because I enjoyed, even if I didn't get the gig, I always loved auditioning. I did. And whether I got it or not, sometimes it's frustrating, but mm -hmm. I like being in front of somebody. And I especially like when I was able to act a scene, not just, you know, do the work, read the lines, but act off of somebody. So it was more realistic for me. But around that time in 2015, definitely, um, they wanted everything to start being Skype. Now, it's, I know it's probably not Skype now. It's probably Zoom or whatever they use like we're doing. And they wanted you to do it like that. And I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But I always, I, for me personally, I didn't enjoy looking into the camera like that. I wanted to be in front of somebody and, and do it. Um, so when you went out there in 15, uh, obviously you went out there in, in to LA in person, but were you dealing with like the things with Skype and having to do uh, auditions like that too? Well, the way that I finally was able to get into the industry was 100% right time and place. I desired it when I was a child and my market would have been Manhattan. And my mother felt like she didn't have the connections. She didn't have the wherewithal to keep me safe as a young girl, as a child actor out of New York City, right? So I then tried again yeah, for modeling and things like that in my teens, in my late teens. There wasn't a market in North Carolina. So what had happened was in 2013, my husband and I separated. And it was um, a very impactful time on my life because I finally put my foot down and said, you know what, I've given you all these years and we have all these children. And mind you, my son was 18 months old. My youngest was 18 months old in 2013. And I said, you know what, my marketability to go back into corporate is nothing. You know, I've been out of corporate for so long, I would start over and um, I'm going to go after what I want to do. So I interviewed with a um, an agent here in Atlanta. And I kind of, I didn't have myself psyched up. I was like, okay, Elizabeth, like, you know, you're 35, you're gonna hear, sweetheart, you're too old. Where were you 10 years ago? You know, and this is what's going through my head, but I was still positive and I was still gonna go in there and blow them away. So I did, and they loved it and they signed me. And they said, but you've got to get some experience on set. So I made up a plan. <laughs> And I don't know how it worked. I decided I'm only doing three months of extra work to learn the etiquette, to learn mm -hmm. your exposure, to learn what you're supposed to do. And at that same time, I'm going to hire an acting coach. So I did. And then I said, January 1, I'm going to start auditioning. So January 1, I did my first audition and I got a pretty major supporting role in a film that was here in Atlanta. It was Atlanta based. 
and uh, it allowed me to be SAG eligible. I mean, straight out that like, who gets that? That's Nobody right. gets yeah, that. Yeah, that's good. And from that moment forward, it was just a whirlwind because three months after that, so now this is six months of saying, I'm going to be an actress. I had the top model and film agency in Atlanta call me and say, we need to meet. And that was that was a weird meeting because they basically said, well, you have to have five years of experience before we can pick you up. If you had that, we'd pick you up today. But then they read my entire bio that I didn't even know my, I had, all my kids' names, my address, my phone number, everything. And the one main thing I got out of that was you need to have a stage name. So I created that. So let's flash forward to get to the answer of your question. I didn't feel that I was ready to go to LA, but I had noticed something. As much work as I was doing in Atlanta and as much representation as I had, I had a Nashville agent, I had an Atlanta agent, all these things were happening for me. There's a ceiling here in Atlanta. And I knew that I would have to go to LA at some point and you know, have my coaches out there, find management, hopefully get signed to an agency, and then I can come back to home base with all my kids and book out in Atlanta because now you're gonna be viewed as something else. Wasn't sure that that was gonna work out, but surprisingly enough, it did. And I have a dear friend of mine, and he's an actor, um, Paul Logan. And Paul reached out to me and he said, Elizabeth, what are you doing? You've got to come out to LA. Now's your time. And I'm like, Paul, I'm not like, I don't think I'm ready. He's like, you have this, you've got your demo reel. You have a good resume. You have an agent there. You're ready. Come out. So I did. And um, that was a very, very tough time of my life because I would spend six weeks there, come home and be with the kids one week, six weeks there, come home and be the, with the kids one week. It was hard. I missed a lot of things. I missed birthdays. I missed holidays. Um, but you're right. When you go out to LA and you don't really know anybody, um, it just has to be the right time and place for you. And, um, it was for me, I was able to find management. Um, I was able to land a publicist that was interested in repping me, my agent, all these wonderful people. So by the time I moved back to Atlanta, I was an L.A. actress and I booked out just like what I was hoping for. But let's talk about that audition piece that you asked me. Mm -hmm. um, in Atlanta, I had become proficient for the taped auditions. OK. I didn't like them because even though with taped auditions, as you know, you can take many, many takes mm -hmm. until True. you're satisfied with your work. And then you can pilot the way that they tell you to, and you send it off to your agent and they send it to the client. <sighs> I never knew if I had the right eye for it, but I did know that my strength was reading a room. So when I was in LA and I did agent workshops and I did casting director workshops and I went on auditions, those were all in person for me. And I loved it because you can pick up on personalities. Right. You can up on do they like you are they engaged mm -hmm. or are they sort of like mm, she doesn't she doesn't look the part you know right so I prefer the live auditions I wish that there were more um but yeah you're right a lot of things are just taped especially your yeah. first auditions like just tape it it is and I want to piggyback off a talking point that you said because it's relevant for any young actors that are watching this you talked about doing extra work some people look down on extra work I started out doing extra work too I went to I went to a theater, did, we did a, a graduation, a, a study with an Emmy award winning uh, acting teacher. Our graduation thing was doing a play and you know how much work goes into that. Oh my God. I mean, it, I enjoyed the, the applause, the media applause, but I enjoyed that it was so long to practice. Oh my God. But I did House of Cards and I did a couple of Veeps with Julia Louise Dreyfus. And you're absolutely right. I was glad I did those. So when I started to get, I didn't get any big movie stuff, but when I started to do some bigger stuff, even industrial videos, some decent pay and stuff, I understood the lay of the land, who the assistant director was, who the, who this guy was, you know, even even down to where you're going with, with eating. Because there, there's a, 
as you know, on a set, there's protocol. These people get go first. That person goes here. Your marks, you know, all of this type of stuff. So people watching this that say, oh, uh, extra, extra. I'm not saying be a career extra. It's not, it's not my thing. There are career extras. That's, it wasn't. But I tell you, like you said, it really helped me at the beginning, especially on big sets, because those were uh, HBO and, and I think that was Netflix did, did uh, House of Cards. Those were big sets. So you had strong directors and, and ADs and, and all of those people. So I, I agree with that. Um, I want to talk about in 2017, you started your podcast, The Caffeinated Cooper Show. Now, knowing you, I don't really think you need any caffeine, but I love the name still. Let me ask you, how did you come up with the name and then talk about your show? Well, I came up with the name because I kept hearing the same thing over and over again. When I was on set, people would say, how do you have so much energy? Not that I would always take everything way out of the box, but you know, when you're on set, sometimes you know, a start time may be six o'clock in the evening and 3 a.m., you are still shooting. You're gonna shoot until production is satisfied and you have all your shots. And um, it would always consistently be the same energy. But I don't drink coffee. So I uh, don't go after a lot of caffeine. Uh, but I took that feedback because, you know, trying to figure out what a name would be, considering that I created this online talk show because I was in contract negotiation for season two of the Elizabeth Cooper show, which was a live format talk show. Um, and I really enjoyed doing it live. There again, you get to read your guest. You can kind of, you know, see where they want to go with it because you're truly looking at mannerisms. You're, you're, you know, you and I are looking at each other, mm -hmm. but we're not in the same room. We're not really looking eyeball to eyeball, right? So um, I knew that I couldn't use any type of name like that. So I wanted to stay away from the name Elizabeth Cooper, but I still wanted to bring in part of the name so that people are like, oh yeah, yeah, that's her. And I created it because we were in contract negotiation. The moment that you are no longer in front of eyeballs, you may as well have died because people will forget about you. And, and yeah, that's where it came from. Okay. What do you enjoy? I mean, you're a conversationalist. I mean, that's, that's a given. And if you sit here and tell me you're, you're really an introvert, not an extrovert. I'm calling. I'm throwing a bullshit flag because I don't. It, 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 well, no, I, no. I'm gonna take that back. I digress. If you tell me that, I'm gonna say, well, you know what? You really are a damn good actress because you come. You got a bubbly personality. You're very inquisitive. You have all the things that you need to do because they always say, ah, everybody has a podcast show. Yeah, everybody. A lot of people have a podcast show, but I'm gonna be honest. Not everybody is good at doing it, and I'm not running down anybody because I give anybody credit that tries. But if you want to be honest, and I and that's the way I, I'm trying to be an honest broker and everything I say, not everybody is made to do these. A lot of people don't do their research. A lot of people <laughs> are interviewing somebody and they don't. I mean, I interviewed Melissa Manchester. She's a dear friend of mine now. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she was like, it's so refreshing to do an interview with someone that actually knows my career. Because I do. I get asked a lot of questions and you can tell they have no clue. They just read it, but they have no clue but they're, they're pretending that they know. So for someone starting out that wants to do a podcast, what would, in the type of way that you do your podcast, what would be your words of wisdom to them? Well, I think <clears throat> you definitely said one of them, um, research. You know, you may have someone that refers someone to you, but, you know, like for my show. So it's, the people that are on the show are either from a contact of a contact because, you know, touching back for just a moment with doing the extra work or being on set. If you know how to keep your composure, not be excited because your favorite actor of all time is on set right now, you know, don't be a fan and you just mind your own business and you happen to have the right look and you're intelligent, you take directions well, guess what? They're gonna come up and talk to you. And before you know it, you know some of these people that are really important key people and mm -hmm. they have contacts. And that is, you know, having the contacts is huge. 
and doing your research. Because if you have somebody say, oh, I've got this professional skater for you. She's great. She's going to be able to talk really well. If you know nothing about where did she grow up? What can you find out about her? Read other articles that are written on her. Watch some other podcasts. And if you don't do all that, then your interview is going to be kind of flat. So, yeah, I would say have the contacts, um, you know, do your research and then make sure that you're somebody that can have a full conversation with yourself and nobody else is in the house with you. You can talk to a wall. <laughs> there you go. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, you keep you keep mentioning Georgia area. Correct me if I'm wrong. In the last probably decade or so, it's really built up studio. I, mean, I know you got Tyler Perry there, but you've got a lot of other things that are out of Atlanta or at least out of the Georgia area. I would assume um, Georgia is being smart in a sense that they're giving studios and, and, and productions because New York kind of was doing it for a long time. And then they kind of I don't know if they completely stopped, but a lot of these states are getting in not, I won't say trouble, but they're, they're not giving the, the breaks. And looking at what it brings in for jobs and, and, and revenues for local businesses and, you know, whether it's a restaurant or whatever it may be, um, Atlanta's really building up, would you say? Atlanta's really building up. There's, I think there's a couple of reasons. The number one reason is our um, incentive program. Here in the state of Georgia, you get 37% of your total budget. So that means that you're wrapped, complete budget, hotel rooms, food incidentals, whatever, you get 37% of that back. Hmm. That's huge. So um, that's part of it. The other part is that Atlanta is number one, easy to get to. We have the busiest airport. So we're very, very easy to get to. And we have mountains, we have beach, we have plains, we have coastal, we have hills. I mean, we have so many different in a small compact area really so many different scenes so many different places that you can film in the state um and everybody's welcoming it you know nobody's tired of it so any little town here will open up the entire town and all of its people to be your extras in the background <laughs> for you to film there you know but yeah, we do have a lot. Tyler Perry, of course, has always been here. We have Queen Latifah, who has a huge bunker. Universal is building right now. Um, the the Pined, uh, Pinewood Studios that they built, which is now under a new name, and I have to be honest, I don't know what the new name is. Um, that facility is unbelievable. We have right across the street, a full weapons training, fight training center for you know for training and things and then we have third rail so third rail studios um uh the rock dwight johnson right <laughs> dwayne johnson oh <laughs> dwayne johnson sorry <laughs> terrible names dwayne johnson he films most of his stuff out of third rail which is in alpharetta georgia okay. so yeah i mean there's a lot of stuff here okay before we segue into the second half of the 360 conversation, which is just fun, random questions, there's no wrong or right answers. They're just fun, whatever comes off the top of your head. I want to ask you one final question professionally. The phone rings, right? Well, it's a cell phone. So I'm, I'm thinking the old days when the phone rings at the house. Who has a house phone? Do you have a house phone? I don't have a house phone anymore. No. It doesn't even make sense to have a house phone. The phone rings. And it's an opportunity of a lifetime, whether it's acting, writing, producing, whatever, but it's a big, big, big opportunity. What would you hope it would be? What would I hope that it would be? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> prepare for dead air for a moment. While yeah, that's okay. Um, that's what would it be? Oh my gosh. That's really hard to answer. Good question. It is. Yeah. Um, well, what's one of your dreams professionally? See, I have always just lived in music. I love music and I do write lyrically. So I'm registered with BMI. I would say, even though, you know, a, a great motion picture would be phenomenal or uh, a long running series, you know, would be fantastic. I would say something within the music world of being able to work with 
a an artist that is I, I can't even think of who, but right. <laughs> you know, I, I would say because I haven't done a lot of that. Okay. You know, I, yeah, yeah, it would it would be something in music, but man, that's okay. a great answer. All right. right, no, no, that that's a that's a good answer. I understand exactly what you're saying. Okay, all right. First fun random question: What is your favorite genre of movies? Uh, I would say horror only because I I never liked horror before. I, I didn't like that whole being scared and you jump out of your seat. Because I've been on set of horror films and I've seen them come out with like the chemical sprayer, you know, and the wand and what they're spraying is Wilton's cake dye to make like pools of blood and the Alka-Seltzer in the mouth for foaming out of the mouth. It's hilarious. Do, have you ever seen the movie Tropic Thunder? Of course, Did with it, Robert Downey Jr. Ben Stiller. That's what horror looks like to me. That first scene where like the spaghetti's coming out of his yeah. gut. Like that's all I see now. So I, yeah, I would say horror. horror. Okay. I know favorite is hard. So I always say to people, if you don't have a favorite movie, what is a movie that Elizabeth can put in over and over again and it never gets old and watch? Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder, okay. <laughs> Great movie. What do you, what do you, uh, it, uh, Robert Downey Jr. was fan. I think he was up for an Oscar for that role. He was, yeah. good, he was good in that. Okay. Do you have a favorite, and there's, there's no uh, era for this, favorite TV show? Mm, favorite TV show? Um... I really liked Dirty Sexy Money. Do you remember that one? It wasn't on for very long. Um, it had Kiefer Sutherland in it. It had, um, oh, what's his name? Oh man, bright blue eyes. Um, and they're Baldwin. It had one of the Baldwins in it. Okay. Um, it yeah, or was a regular TV? It was regular TV and okay. it must have been 15 years ago. Um, they only did one season and then they they cut it, they canned it. Okay. But I enjoyed it. Okay. Now you said music. This is gonna be a tough one. So, but I'm still gonna ask you. Do you have a favorite musical band of all time? Musical band of all time. I would have to throw back to what I mainly listened to, you know, when I was a kid. Um and it's going to be between The Cure, Good one. Uh, Depeche Mode, Duran Duran. I, I'm going to give it to Duran Duran only because they came out with that album like in 1994. So it extended their duration. Yes. So let's, let's, I'll just say Duran Duran. Okay. So who's the hottest one in the band to you, Simon? I, I really wasn't into any of them. Okay. <laughs> Did you see they got they got put in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I think it was last year. Yeah, I did. Okay. What is, off the top of your head, one of your most memorable childhood memories? Memorable childhood. So what quantifies a child? How old? Uh, seven to 10, 11, that, around there. Well, my parents took my brother and I to Ireland and I was it was 1987 so I was 10 and that was probably the most memorable my father had called to Ireland because you didn't have the internet then right so you couldn't book things online he had uh, found some sort of advertisement god knows where in some magazine where you can rent a castle, huh. like an Airbnb type of thing, but it was a castle and we stayed in this thing. And man, that was, it was wild. It was on the, um, just below Dublin, a couple of towns below Dublin. And so it was rural and you had the cattle and we, there was a little stream. My father taught me how to fly fish. Oh, wow. That's cool. That was a great that's memory. A, that's a great one. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite noise or sound you like to hear? Oh boy. 
Oh boy. Uh, favorite noise or sound? Birds. Okay. In the, in the morning time or just any time? Anytime. I enjoy watching the birds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now flip that. This is usually the funny one. Flip it. What's your least favorite noise or sound? Oh my gosh. I almost attacked some guy at, <laughs> at my daughter's dance recital last week. It's a water bottle. And it's that when they're just standing there crinkling it, this yeah. guy had an empty water bottle. It was intermission. He stood up and he, he's just crinkling it just, just like this. And I look over and I'm like, what are we... Unless you're going to start singing to a tune, you need to stop. Like, <laughs> I know that's right. Empty, sir, it's empty. <laughs> um, but, and that's only because, you know, we've used a lot of the disposable water bottles. Mm -hmm. So I'll chuck it back to the kids because oh, if you have water. I don't know what it is with these kids, but they have to be drinking and eating in the car. Like, we never did that. No, we, we didn't. We never we did know, that. We didn't. And they just act like we're going on like a 14 mile hike or something. It's like, no, we're, we're driving across town. You're going to be okay. But every time they drink out of it, they squeeze it. So yeah, that's, that's, okay. that's a no, no for me. All right. Do you have a guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Um, yeah. I mean, I like getting away by myself. Okay. And being a mom of five kids, you know, I, I was a mom for the first time in 2001 and it hasn't stopped. <laughs> that's, that's a long time to be constantly chasing. Are you little. Catholic? Are you Catholic? Uh, I am Catholic. I'm no longer practicing, but yeah. I, <laughs> no, I I'm am. just saying you can't, you can't. <laughs> you can't yeah, yeah. Stop. Uh, Okay. So getting away by myself, you know, okay. I have a steel hand pan drum. And I'll take that with me and play it. And yeah. Cool. What is the first job you ever had? Mm -hmm. The, okay. First, I was self-employed and I was seven or eight. Um, and remember, you know, talking about Metuchen, we could go down mm -hmm. to buy little candies. Well, I walked to school. And when I walked to school with my friends, we had to go through downtown, past the Amtrak train station, cross the street, and go down a couple more streets, and we'd get to school. So we had a habit of using, like, our little allowance, and we'd buy, like, a bazooka piece of bubble gum or something. So I knew I needed money, and um, I decided to pick up all the newspapers a day late that my neighbors didn't go out and go pick up. Huh. And I made a big sign and I put it on my front porch, newspapers for sale, a dollar. So a couple of people came up and they bought the newspapers and gave me a dollar. This one guy stopped his car, got out. And he's like, oh, thank God, I need the paper. And he buys the paper and he's he's walking down the steps of my front porch out to his car. And he's like, wait a minute. This is <laughs> yes. Days. I have where's your mother? So <laughs> that was my first job. I had two weeks. And uh yeah, that guy ruined it. Um, <laughs> okay. And then like first job employed by someone else, like real actual job. I worked in a bakery. Okay. And um she put me in charge of making sandwiches. I was 15 and I worked there for two weeks. And then she called my mother and she's like, I just found out that I really can't hire her because she's too young. So I got fired. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, because I'm a visual person and my my mind goes like this. So earlier you talked about Lucy, Lucille Ball. Yeah. And you just talked about a bakery. You yeah. know what I could see you doing? I'm serious. And you probably know where I'm going with this. That, that conveyor belt with her and her and Ethel. That was probably one of the funny today. Debbie and I go to this place called Shoops. It's a hamburger place here and it's in Crown Point, not too far from us. And they have a picture of her, you know, when she's eating, when she's eating the chocolates. Yeah. I could see you reenacting that and being hilarious doing it. Because you oh, have so that, you have that, you know, the, the whole everything that you could do it. Wait, was that not funny though? That was hilarious. That was hilarious. And then the other one that she, um, the other episode where she did, what was it? Vege, Vegemite. Yes. yes. Something. Hilarious. Uh, I, I, it's funny because last night we were in another place. We tried to do a little diner here 
and it had a picture, a lot of, uh, it was 50s decor. So they had Lucy and, and, and Desi. I don't know if you remember this, but they drove cross country to California and Ethel, Fred, Lucy and Ricky stopped at a hotel that was by a train and the beds, I don't know if you remember that episode, the beds were moving as the train was going by. I mean, just hilarious, hilarious. And Fred had that, like the, the cap on his head. It was just, uh, this show is classic. Okay. Favorite vacation destination would be? Hawaii. Okay. I love it. Yeah, I've been to Kauai and uh, Maui. And um, it, it's it's just like an escape from reality. I mean, I know real human people live there and that's their life. But I mean, uh, it, yeah, it's fantastic. Okay. Elizabeth, if you could meet one person from any time in history, dead or alive, any walk of life, who would you like to meet? And what would either be your first question or things that you'd like to talk to that individual that you pick about? Robin Williams. Okay, great one. He was definitely, you know, within my sights. I wanted to, not that I would have been able to work with him. I just wanted to be on the same set with him um, to see him and his craft because yeah. it, it was so mastered. Now, what would I ask him? Um, mm, um, I, I don't know. I, I really, what would I ask him? Um, man, what news do you watch? I mean, <laughs> okay. Okay. Jokes okay. I, like, can, I can imagine what Rob Williams would say. Okay. Yeah. With everything we discussed tonight, mm -hmm. if you had to sum yourself up in a few thoughts as a human being, what would you say? Um, I would say, you know, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, I don't know how to pretend, even though I'm an actor that's not pretending right so but it just WYSIWYG you see what you know you see what you get like this this is it okay. <laughs> you no know? I mean like we disconnect and I'm still the same person and there's so many people out there where what you see is just a mask you know mm -hmm. and I don't believe in the mask so okay yeah and final question what message or hope do you have for humanity? Mm. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. And the message or hope that I have for humanity is the realization within that word, humanity. We are all human. And the reason why I was thinking and how this ties in, thinking about this, I went on a field trip with my son, my fifth grader yesterday. And I really enjoyed that his experience young, you know, in those formidable years is a lot like the experience I had. And this does touch back to different races, different cultures of people, right? So when I went to school, it was truly a melting pot. It was everybody and anybody you could imagine were my friends and we were all friends together. Everybody had friends like that. And now my children get to enjoy that too, where they, we have all cultures over at this house mm -hmm. and they don't see that the, the difference in the way that they would act like they, you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, we, we all see that everyone is different. Right. And everybody is different and every culture is different. Ethnicity is different. And that's wonderful and beautiful. But when it comes to talking to somebody or befriending somebody, there's no, there's nothing to cloud that. And I didn't realize how great that was until I lived in different places of the United States. 
And I saw the segregation of people. I saw and heard the negativity of one ethnicity thinking, you know, something about something else and being so open and brazen to say those things. That's not my world. And um, I think for humanity, we need to realize we are all human and we all are striving for the same thing of having a happy, healthy, long life. And uh, that's my message is really kindness. Okay. If you would for the viewers, because I don't type the stuff in like you do. That's it's too advanced for me. Go yeah. ahead and tell them where to find your show, what social media platforms you're on. Go for it. Okay. So the show is the Caffeinated Cooper Show. You can find us as uh, the Caffeinated Cooper Show channel on YouTube. I am Elizabeth Cooper on Facebook, Cooper Studios page on Facebook. Um, Cooper, Elizabeth Cooper on Instagram. And the show is also on Amazon Prime as the Caffeinated Cooper Show and the Binge Networks as the Caffeinated Cooper Show. Okay. I'm going to close with a few thoughts and I'm going to give you back the mic to close out completely. First of all, thank you for coming on tonight. Been long overdue. Should have had you on a long time ago. And I still want to get you on one of my eventually when I start bringing them back, one of my Moving Humanity Forward panels as well. Like I, like I mentioned when I did your show last week. My show is all about moving humanity forward. And your case, you're an artist. And you're humanitarian. And you use your voice because you're comfortable to do it. I know you don't get into politics and all that. And that's fine. We have a different format. That's okay. You can still move humanity forward in the way that you're doing it. And you do that by bringing people on your show and allowing other people to hear People talk about it doesn't have to be politics. It could be just about life or growing up, or it could be a recipe. If that brings happiness to somebody, whatever it is, it's what I call moving humanity forward. And you're doing that through your show. And I appreciate that. And those are the type of guests that I like to have on. I like to, and when I say a 360, I, would, I like to do a 360 of the person starting it when they grew up and, and things that uh, form them to become the individuals that they are. So I thank you again for moving humanity forward through your show. I'm, I've enjoyed doing it. I got to give a shout out to your publicist and my pal, Carlos, because he brought us together. So I, I thank you, Carlos. Don't say I didn't give you a shout out because I just did. Okay, he'll call me a week from Friday and tell me he's calling me Tuesday. You know how Carlos is. But again, thank you. And what I want to do is give you back the microphone and you close out with anything you want. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm honored to be on your show. I love what you do. And you've been on my show twice. So I owe you. You just let me know whenever you'd like me to come back on. And you're right. In the show, I don't really get into politics on my show. I'm happy to do it for you on your show because I know that is a, a part of your platform. Right. But I just, you know, thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, as I tell you in the green room before my show, it's a spotlight on you. And I am so very thankful that you've given me the spotlight. So you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And, and same back to you. And we will talk soon and uh, enjoy the rest of your Saturday night. Thank you. You too. Okay. Good night. Good night. Hey, folks, that's another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. Elizabeth Cooper, host of the Caffeinated Cooper Show. Another great guest, very enjoyable 360 conversation and learning about her. Remember folks, if you see these shows and you like them, subscribe, retweet them when I put them on Twitter. I greatly appreciate it. Remember that my show is always about moving humanity forward. So each time you subscribe, you're gonna be seeing content that I feel is doing that, and especially guests that are absolutely doing that. All right, and on that note, remember, Every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad Brad out. Thank you for watching the Bad Brad Berkwood Show. Please follow, subscribe, leave comments, forget about it, and move humanity forward.